Yeah, I, I presented in this class too, yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all good in here? How about online? Are we getting thumbs up? Thumbs up if you could hear me. Thanks for the thumbs up. Everything good online? Let's give us. Perfect. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Saidi, and I'm part of the education team here at the People's Forum, along with Lan. Who's over here? Give us a wave. There's Lan. Perfect. All right, so thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited for our second session of Science Against Capitalism, the role of biophysical sciences in building a sustainable future for all. So this is our second session, and the third session will happen next month, next year, on microbial ecologies with Dr. Suzanne Peer. So if you're interested, join us for that. But also, if you're really interested, join us for our discussion cohort. You don't have to be a scientist or someone who's studied science for 37 years Come join us if you're interested in struggling for a better world. It's really fun. We meet once a month on Wednesday, so the Wednesday before the seminars on Saturdays. So come join us. If you have any questions, ask any of us here or check it out on peoplesforum.org. So I'm really excited um, to welcome David Schwartzman here, a Brooklyn native. Brooklyn's in the house. He was a professor at Howard University for 39 years with his research focusing on climate science and biogeochemistry. Along with his son, Peter Schwartzman, he published a book, The Earth is Not for Sale, which looks at the topics of climate science, um, biogeochemistry, there it is, um, degrowth, eco-socialism, and a whole bunch of amazing things. So definitely, definitely, definitely check it out. Also very excited to welcome our dear friend and comrade, Salvatore Engel de Mauro, who is a phenomenal professor at SUNY New Pulse, as well as an author of socialist, what is it, socialist, um, there it is, social states and the environment. There it is. There's a lot of, a lot of eco-socialism eco going around. I'm so excited. Um, I'm really excited also to thank Capitalism, Nature, and Socialism, and Science for the People, and Eco-Socialist Horizons for really collaborating with us to make this possible. So with that, I'm excited to pass it over to Salvatore to lead us through this wonderful seminar. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming, and to all the people on Zoom, uh, greetings. So, um, some of you I, I know have been uh, at the first opening, I suppose, of, uh, of this uh, series. And so um, you might already know something about um, the, um, the main motivation for, uh, for having it in the first place. Um, I wanted to add that um, David has also collaborated quite a lot with capitalism and socialism as well, for which I'm, I've been editor. <clears throat> and uh, so in some ways, uh, some of the discussion that he will be presenting has also appeared in the journal, as well as in the journal Science and Society, of which he's also a member. Um, one other thing that I wanted to add is that he's, uh, he's written quite a lot for a long time, and uh, I think a lot of his work has been uh, underappreciated. Uh, one of the things that maybe some might not know is that already back in the 70s, he was trying to link up Marxist method with um, scientific endeavor. Um, I think it was a 1979 article, I believe, in which you uh, you were drawing on Althusser in terms of understanding the the process. 76, uh, trying to understand the dynamics of discovery and and how to have a uh, Marxist method that would be, um, I suppose, um, uh, in combination with scientific work and it's actually something that has influenced me so i'm i kind of represent maybe a, f a following generation uh, who, who's been influenced by his work um so for me it's a special occasion indeed in many ways um one of his uh, um i guess more recent volumes is called life temperature and the earth for those of you who are into geology and into long-term climate change dynamics that would be a really good work um to look into particularly because i think it's not exactly made evident, but it, there is a, um, a dialectical materialist um, thought pattern in that book in one way or another, if I may. <laughs> in any case, one of the main things that animates this series is um, the, um, the uh, attempt um, to persuade as many socialists as possible to become scientists who will be contributing directly in the making 
of the biophysical sciences rather than just as passive recipients of the data that are produced by mostly uh, bourgeois-minded scientists. That's one of the key things that I hope everybody, or at least some of you, will be interested in pursuing, um, even if not directly. If not directly, just spreading the word among scientists and um, seeking and finding allies within the biophysical sciences, I think is really important for socialist causes. Recruiting scientists in socialist formations would be great. So that, those are some of the things that I hope people will want to do uh, as part of, uh, of this endeavor, which I think needs to be broader than just the seminar series. Of course, becoming a socialist in the biophysical sciences would be the ultimate achievement in terms of what is being set out here, but also organizing events like this one. So if you are keen on, on something of this nature um, and um, you'd like to do it as well, uh, please uh, seek us as well, or just do it, and uh, it would be great to have a report back on it. All right, so with all that said, we've invited David to discuss a few things uh, with respect to his um, lifetime work in, geo in geochemistry and um, in um, the struggles with respect to climate change and with his ideas uh, for a future that he uh, has coined uh, in terms of solar communism, which I find a rather happy um, um, couple of terms being put together. So one of the things that we'd like him to discuss is how have you become a Marxist by geochemist? What path or paths would you recommend to achieve that? Okay, now, uh, first I want to uh, thank the People's Forum. I've never been here before. It's a new institution. It's wonderful. I grew up in Brooklyn. I went to City College. And uh, it's a wonderful. Oh. Yeah, I have it on. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, uh, and uh, don't believe anything I say. <laughs> uh, look it up for yourself. I mean, I taught at Howard University for 39 years. That's what I always told my students. I didn't hide what I thought, but I wanted them to think critically. And uh, so uh, the same advice here. So please skip. You got to go forward because I put the fourth question first. So please scroll through. It's near. <laughs> it's going to be several slides. Well, as, as we get into that, I just wanted to also make sure that you know, there are readings that we've uh, shared with, uh, with people who've registered, and I hope you had a chance to, um, to at least skim through them, just to give a, get a sense of, of, of the work that David has been doing. All uh, right. Uh, yes, this is it. Okay, so how did the question... How did you become a Marxist by yeah, geochemist? I mean, it's not every day that we get to see this. It rocks in a red diaper because I'm a red diaper baby. Do you all know what that means? My parents were communists. They met in 1940 in Brooklyn. And um, my father was a staunch Marxist Leninist to his dying day. Uh, and we had some differences, but his yeah, values certainly. Uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, my dad's middle name, I gave him a middle name. We're having a, an interesting oh, technical uh, effect. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what is what is what are you what you're stating is being thrown right back at you? <laughs> Not sure. Oh, We're having a, uh, an interesting technical effect. Um, yeah, some guy is talking. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what, is, what, are you, what are you stating is being thrown right back at you? And to me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me when I should. Let's see. Right. It's good. Thanks. Okay, so uh, my, I gave my dad a middle name. Stalin made some mistakes. Uh, that's when I had a conversation with him about Stalin. But uh, his, his values certainly inspired me. 
and uh, he was never subject to really seriously the McCarthy period because he was self-employed. He was a diamond setter on the Bowery with two of his brothers. And even though the FBI visited, you know, our home once and the shop, he just told them to get the fuck out. Uh, so he inspired me by his uh, resistance. Even he took me to the movies in the early fifties and they had newsreels which were anti-communist. Then your movie cost a quarter and they had two features in a newsreel and they would have some anti-communist stuff and he would just yell out in the audience, that's a bunch of lies. So that was his inspiration for my, uh, I guess I like to question authority. I don't care who it is. Okay, but you know, do it tactfully. You know, <laughs> that's my advice. So uh, he brought me a book one day. I remember I was sitting in a stoop on Skank Avenue, no, Cleveland Street, where I grew up. And he brought me a book on first book on stones or rocks. And I started collecting rocks and minerals. I went to the Museum of Natural History, you know, in Manhattan. I probably crossed path with uh, Stephen Jay Gould. He was in the paleontology, the dinosaur thing. I was up in the minerals collection. And I started collecting, and then I made chemical experiments. I had a chemistry set and I burned holes in the linoleum and things like that. And uh, we also set off rockets. Mine never really flew up. We put, uh, don't try this, but I put it in a cardboard tube, uh, sulfur and zinc. And uh, it went up a little bit. <laughs> um, but at those days, this is uh, like Sputnik. Uh, kids were putting in, in pipes and they blew their fingers off, it exploded. So at least I didn't do that. Um, so that led me to really appreciate natural history as well, because I, I have a long association with Camp Midvale in New Jersey. It's now called the White Psychology Center. And that was um, basically a left-wing camp uh, which uh, at so-called interracial camp where people from New York City would go and uh, grew up there. And uh, that's the, um, the woods there. You know, I started collecting leaves and insects and so on. So I had a contact with nature and with uh, experimental science at the same time. And then of course I, found the Marxist classics in a cabinet below the TV set where my dad kept these, you know, it didn't, didn't have the Communist Manifesto for some reason, nor Dialectics of Nature, which I got later on from uh, a friend. Uh, but that influenced my thinking, you know, in the early 50s. Well, yeah, I guess about the early 50s, I started reading this stuff. And uh, so Dialectics of Nature by Engels really had a big influence on my thinking. And I read some of the books. My, I, I lived in my grandfather's house in, in Brooklyn for a while. And my uncle lived on the bottom floor and he had some books from some so uh, Soviet authors on natural history. And I remember reading something about biology having an effect on weathering. Mm -hmm. uh, and then much later, I kind of worked on that subject. So so the second part that Saeed wanted, what would I recommend? Well, to, to you who are interested in going into natural physical sciences, I would study STEM, of course, get well-grounded, and uh, that is science, technology, engineering, and math, and natural history, and you know, read read Marxism, and not only Marxism, but a wide area on science and philosophy of science. But you, you should know the counter arguments. You know, as Lenin respected a real good idealist, 
philosopher in contrast to a vulgar materialist, right? He made a point, you can learn more from a, a thinking idealist than you can from a vulgar materialist. I think I remember that. Uh, and get involved in obviously the struggles, especially climate change, which has very, a lot of ramifications. I mean, the challenge there to us is to connect the immediately felt impacts, not only flooding and fires and all of that, but air pollution, the health impacts of the air pollution on the community. I've, I see that in Washington, D.C., where a recent study showed that the, air, the rate of death from air pollution is four times higher east of the river where black folk mainly live to more affluent water. So, and, and we now know even not only childhood asthma is driven significantly by air pollution, but cancer, cardiovascular disease, and even dementia from fine particles, there's new evidence there too. Hmm. Okay, so that that's the answer to the first question. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Now, where you want to scroll back to the second slide. And by the way, if anyone's interested in getting a copy of this presentation, just send me an email and I'll send you a PDF. I have supplementary slides, which I probably won't get to, but kind of add to the argument. So. Uh, is that the second one? That is the second. No, the first. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's right. Oh, yeah. This is the. What second. is? I yeah. want to say something about science. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by science? Uh, first of all, I rejected the description that science is Western. It's never been Western, and it isn't now. Okay. It's and here's a very good account documenting the history of science that. Uh, brings th that uh, point to four, well documented, uh, Poskett's book, and also a People's History of S Science mm -hmm. is another one. Uh, but this is a quotation from my book, my book with my oldest son, Peter, uh, who's also a climate scientist, by the way, he's the mayor of Galesburg, Illinois. Uh, highest office of any member of the Green Party of Illinois. Okay, my oldest son. Uh, and this is the, the, the Earth is not for sale book. So uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically, here the message is that it's not sufficient to have a vision of 21st century socialism, in which I would say the only viable socialism in the 21st century is what we call eco-socialism, okay? And uh, it's not only, should not only be based on political economy and sociology, but uh, take full account of the knowledge of science, and particularly climatology, ecology, biochemistry, thermodynamics, and of course the long experience of indigenous people on our planet and their practical knowledge on agriculture and social organization. We should, that has to be uh, incorporated, integrated together in our agenda. So we argued that not only for renewable energy, green production, agroecologies. Um, so that that's a fundamentally what I think is lacking in a lot of the discourse on eco-socialism even. If you get a, a recent issue of Monthly Review was all devoted to eco-socialism, but not one author had a, what was a, a natural physical scientist. Okay? They're all sociologists or economists. And it, not that there was, you know, it's a lot to gain from reading it, but I think it was in, in our understanding would be enriched and deepened if we bring in science into the conversation. Um, and particularly on the degrowth issue. And I, I had a critique of John Bell and Lee Foster, uh, which is 
on, I think also on your reading list, was a, a critique of degrowth uh, that was uh, published on uh, Climate and Capitalism website, beginning of the year. And I submitted first to Monthly Review Online, they rejected it because I had a very respectful, but some criticism of what John Bellamy Foster said. I mean, this is kind of a, uh, well, yeah. Rather than go that route, David, I would I would suggest keeping if the, if it, if it's okay to because one of the readings that we had um, offered uh, to people was your work actually on on climate change, which is actually speaks to like the importance of bringing in these uh, biophysical science voices into the discussion, of, for example, of degrowth, but but also in general okay. for eco socialism. Yeah. So, but yeah. one of the things that you want to get to the second question? It would be, yeah, just because it, it, it yeah. to demonstrate how exactly, what are the dynamics of being able to um, integrate a Marxist yeah. approach to doing climate change science? Right. So that, that article from Ames Energy is not exactly, I guess, at first sight, self-evidently a Marxist work. However, exactly, but what you do is that you bring up issues that uh, certainly, yes, oh, okay. uh, but you bring up issues that uh, it will be well within an eco-socialist agenda. Yeah. So that to us anyway, was, you know, sort of trying to put this together, thought, well, this is a, could be one of the ways in which you could represent how you've approached the field of biogeochemistry and thermodynamics. And so maybe if you could discuss more, what is your approach? And how is it affected, you know, how is it inflicted by a Marxist understanding, you know, in, in terms of how you uh, do research in thermodynamics and do research in biogeochemistry as you, and it's changed over time. And then secondly, um, how does your research um, address um, these fields um, as well? You know, how, how do you insert yourself Next in this? Part. Okay, so this was your second question. Mm. Uh, so this is some of the work I've done on biogeochemistry and how it's related to materialist dialectics and biospheric evolution. So this is the book, I didn't bring a copy, but uh, this kind of brings it out, the self-organizing biosphere, okay? And I wrote uh, this paper, which came out just two years ago, made the case that the evolution of our biosphere, the biosphere is the environment with life in it, which inhabits uh, anywhere where life exists, even in several kilometers down in the ocean floor in the sediments, there are microbes and having influence, but, and there's microbes on dust particles in the atmosphere, you could say that, of course, the atmosphere is part of the biosphere, but you're talking about, here's a soil scientist, it's a soil, it's even deeper down in the crust, and of course, the surface. So this was a paper I did, and I'll get to some of the theses very briefly, of the dialectics of biospheric evolution. This was, in honor of Richard Levin. So I participated in a program at Harvard School of Public Health, um, which uh, honored he was still alive then. Uh, so the, the next slide. Um, was that the next slide? Or we skip one? No, no, go back, go back early on. Okay, next slide. Okay, oh no, you skipped another connection. Wait, all right. There was cross connections between the energy issue and biogeochemistry. In particular, the biogeochemical cycle of carbon. That's fundamental to understand climate change because biogeochemical cycle is how where carbon migrates, you know, from one, uh, let's say, compartment of the biosphere to another, the atmosphere, the soil, the rock, reacting with rock, the ocean, and so on. And I did a paper, I was a co-author on this paper, a recent paper, 
which made the case that there is multiple steady, possibly multiple steady states in the long-term common cycle. So let me, let me uh, because this has relevance too, to direct air capture of CO2 from the atmosphere and reacting with rock, which I will argue with my son in our age paper, that this is very likely to be necessary. This, let me be clear, this is not a practice to perpetuate the consumption of fossil fuel, which must be curbed as soon as possible. This is to draw down the uh, dangerous level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is now over 410 parts per million, bringing it down over a long period in the future because the ocean will keep on releasing CO2 to the atmosphere, which drives a uh, greenhouse and warming. Uh, as you draw CO2 out of the atmosphere, the ocean will equilibrate with the atmosphere. You have to, this will have to go on to a long, it's a long-term project, which will have to be powered by significant capacity of renewable energy. Obviously not fossil fuel, that just compounds it. The, the problem. So the, let me say something about the long-term common cycle, because that was the, really the focus of uh, my book, Life Temperature in the Earth, and research that I've done. So the long-term common cycle involves a source from the Earth, and that's CO2 from volcanoes, which the anthropogenic release of CO2 from burning fossil fuels like 60 times higher flux, flux being how much per time is released from one place to another from, um, so volcanoes are the, law, are the source to the atmosphere and ocean of common CO2. And the sink, there's a process that removes it and that's the reaction of CO2 in soil with certain minerals. And uh, I'll write an equation, Mike. So we have calcium, magnesium, silicates, a common mineral like olivine, which is, um, very in in mafic rocks like basalt. Yeah, I'm not going to balance this equation, but CO2 plus water, and what you get is calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate, like which makes up limestone. You know the shells of uh, clams and coral and so on mainly calcium, but magnesium too. And, and then you get silica precipitate. And uh, well, what, what happens is, I'm leaving out a step. It goes to the ocean. I'm leave, this is the intermediate step. Bicarbonate ions plus this, this gets precipitated in the, in the uh, soil, silica, and, and calcium ions and magnesium ions. And then that is precipitated in the ocean. And one CO2 is then released too. And uh, I guess there's a water there too. But uh, the, you have to balance out the hydrogen. So this is where this is geochemistry. So what happens is this is in rivers. So you have bicarbonate and dissolved calcium and magnesium in rivers that flow to the ocean. And then the ocean is near saturation and calcium carbonate precipitates in the ocean. That's a sink. There's one CO2 that's trapped as on the seafloor as carbonate. Of course, it's mediated by life now, you know, by clams and coral, but even with no life, it would still precipitate once it's saturated. So this is the sink 
for CO2. In the long-term carbon cycle, the source being volcanoes. And David, that sink becomes part of rock formations. Yes. So that's become part of the crust. Now, this is a key to the same reaction, but accelerated is the key to actually direct air capture of CO2. And there was a great article in Scientific American not too long ago about the potential of Oman right on the eastern part of this Saudi Arabian uh, peninsula. They have a big deposit of ultramafic rock, which is the most susceptible to reacting with CO2 and water. And so I was just talking, Saeed, about the potential of building a huge renewable facility in this really great location, high solar flux, ideally, and capturing solar energy in either in mainly probably concentrated solar power and using this energy to for direct air capture and burying, drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere and burying it in the crust permanently. This is not like capturing CO2 from a smokestack and pumping it down into some formation which it could leak out or even worse, what BP is interested in is to use a CO2 to pump down oil deposits to release oil. <laughs> I mean, this, this is the false solution that we explore in our book, by the way. One of the false solutions, and which is promoted you know, presently by federal funding, but not all this research is bad. It, what's necessary, there is a pilot project actually operating in Iceland, and that's basaltic rock which is very, uh, the, the results show that's very uh, successfully permanently bearing CO2 in, as carbonate in the rock, in the rock formation. So I'll get back to that because that's not the only thing we need to do, but I think it's gonna be necessary for a long time in the future. And uh, some of the greens, dismiss all of it and put it in one basket. But I think that's a mistake. Because again, one needs to look, think critically about the science and the climate science has to inform our political practice, first of all, right? Because that's telling us how much time we have left and what the, what's, at, at, what's at risk for our children and grandchildren in the world. That's our responsibility to address and not to accept be the fetus and say, well, we're not going to, we're going to breach one and a half degrees centigrade. We might as well accept it. There are voices, even in, you know, the mainstream, oh, we got to go to geoengineering, we can get to that. But uh, that's a bad, that should not be accepted, that message, in my opinion, because it's the fetism. And we should not accept defeat. But what we have is an opportunity. If we defeat fossil capital, we have the opportunity then to move it forward and defeat all capital and move to eco-socialist transition in the world. That's the great opportunity we have. Okay, so we should be optimistic to seize that opportunity and not be uh, demoralized by, by the challenge. So David, if yeah. I, if you oh, could- Oh, well, let me get back to yeah, but just finish that piece. Exactly, yeah. as you do though, um, if you yeah. could clarify how your Marxist approach informs all of these, all of these uh, studies that you have presented well, to us. Well, this equation had nothing to do with Marxism. I would beg to disagree, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, but you see, when I say that science is global, of course, we recognize the institutions that enable science to occur are deeply political. You know, what research should be done, what shouldn't. I mean, you go to Cuba and they prioritize ecological agriculture, right? And 
vaccines that really protect people. Okay, uh, you go some to a capitalist country and you get research instead of agroecology, a lot of research for gene GML, genetic modification, instead of using molecular biology to uh, make new varieties of plants and that, particularly in food, available to people without this GMO approach, you know. So the, the, I, didn't, I didn't mean to um, give you the impression that science is neutral. No, the institutions that make it possible have to be challenged. But this chemistry is not Marxist or, okay, so, but why choose a certain approach mm -hmm. or opportunity in, let's say scientific research, that should be, I think, can be motivated by the, uh, the agenda, an eco-socialist agenda, right? That's rather than another research. That, that, so your agenda, what you choose to do research in, I mean, if you study geology, the, the most profitable career when I was doing it was petroleum geology. I would have paid really well, uh, you know, helping them find new oil deposits and drill oil bond, but I chose not to. And so um, now just to briefly get back that paper, oh, uh, opened up the possibility that an upper temperature steady state might be achieved by ru basically runaway greenhouse emissions. That is, be hard to get out. Um, and what do I mean by a steady state? Because here's where biology comes in. The, the um, plants and Organisms that live in soil, which are very diverse, the mycorrhizal community, which he's an expert on, um, amplify the weathering process. In other words, it occurs if you get the same flux, this flux here, at lower temperatures. Now, temperature, it itself raising temperature mm -hmm. will accelerate this reaction, this chemical reaction. But biology, the what we call the biotic enhancement of weathering, um, and that's the next slide. Uh oh back, back. <laughs> you skipped over. Um, uh, that's no, that, I think I skipped over. <laughs> no, go earlier one. Go back to near the beginning. Oh, yeah. Uh, I skipped over that one. Um, oh, this one. Okay. So, biotic enhancement of weathering, and I have a I have a bibliography, extensive bibliography to look up the papers at the end, but biology, what we call the biotic and insulin weathering, uh, allows the same flux of bicarbonate and calcium to the ocean at a lower temperature, because biology is doing the work that temperature and higher CO2 would do. Remember, mm -hmm. CO2 level in the atmosphere and temperature are coupled together by a greenhouse effect. Right, the higher CO2, the higher the climatic temperature. So here's where the steady state comes in that let's say uh, if the temperature goes down, the volcanic, let's say uh, the volcanic uh, source of CO2 would then raise the CO2 in the atmosphere, raising the temperature up. Okay. If the, if it goes up too high, then the
the sink is accelerated, that is the effect of temperature and higher CO2, and at least in the tropics, um, to some degree, the biotic effect on weathering, and that will bring the CO2 down. So it reaches a steady state, the, temp the climatic temperature for a certain period of time. But that, that changes over geologic time because the volcanic source changes. Early in Earth history, you had a higher radioactivity in the Earth, uh, mainly uranium, thorium, and radioactive potassium. 40. Do you know that we're all radioactive? <laughs> okay, we have potassium 40. It's a small percentage of natural potassium, and it's decaying in our body right now. Okay, a very low level, but it has a half life of about a little over a billion years. So it's a very low. <laughs> and we also have carbon 14 naturally too in our body. So, you know, all radioactivity is not necessary. I mean, you hear some, and I'm against nuclear fission development, but you hear people say, you know, all radioactivity, that we, uh, it's all not natural. And that's not true. Early in Earth history, these radioactivity was higher because you had a high level of these elements and they've been decaying ever since last four and a half billion years since the Earth formed. Okay, so that is basically driven volcanic outgassing. So it was very likely higher in the past and it's gradually gone down. At the same time, the land area of the earth has grown over geologic time and that has enhanced the sink of carbon, drawing down carbon. And, and then added to that, the, the sun, actually gets brighter as it evolves. And in other words, four and a half billion years ago, you had less solar energy coming to Earth than now. And it'll get even higher in the future. The biosphere will be killed off in a few billion years on Earth in the future because solar luminosity will grow. And the reason is I'm pro-nuclear power. Let me make clear, but it's at a safe distance, 93 million miles away. That's a nuclear fission reactor in the core of the sun. So hydrogen is fusing at about a million degrees to helium. And as the core of the sun gets denser, it speeds up the reaction. So the sun gradually emits more energy uh, going from the pet. So all of those trends you have to model what's the overall effect. The overall effect is likely that the temperature of the climate, let's say 3 billion years ago, was thermophilic over 60 degrees centigrade. And then it's diminished to what we see now. And, and the paper that I gave, uh, and he has supplying geochemistry, biogeochemistry, to understanding biospheric evolution, that the cooling of the climate actually was a constraint on evolution of life. For instance, animal life could not emerge above 50 degrees centigrade. It can't, it can't, it, that's intrinsic to the biochemistry of animals, metazoan. Our earlier photosynthesizing could not occur above a little over 70 degrees centigrade. Okay, so as the climate cooled, it allowed new groups of organisms to emerge. But life was a player in the whole thing. That's the dialectics of it, right? Life was a player because it participated in the biotic enhancement of weathering, among other effects. So early life on land was very, you know, probably microbes. And then when eukaryotes emerged, maybe 2 billion years ago, that is cells with nuclei, like make up our body. You had algae. First you had prokaryotes, that is no nuclei. And then you had eukaryotes. And then uh, later on, of course, plants and animals. 
But plants and forests really enhance the biotic enhancement of weather. So that progressively increased, again, as a cooling factor in the whole cycle. Okay, but it was not going to prevent the destruction of our biosphere in the future because the solar luminosity will overcome that. Okay, so you, this also has to be modeled with the best, you know, information we have, what the intensity of the different effects are and how they play out over time. Um, uh, okay, so the, the energy, I didn't get uh, related on this. So the role of life weathering long-term carbon cycle, I'm very interested in symbiosis. Lynn Margulis, the great late biologist who was a co-partner with James Lovelock in the Gaia hypothesis, she uh, emphasized the role of symbiosis in the history of life, including the emergence of eukaryote cells that were really from the merger of prokaryotes in a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, do you mind if I ask a question? Yeah. Um, So you're talking about modeling the biosphere, and I think bringing the question of eco-socialist aims and making science serve and be motivated by eco-socialist aims, I think discussing to what extent do we need to formalize and model the biosphere? Are we at the point where you think it needs to be modeled to such a resolution? Because I'm really feeling like, how do we embody the science and all of these details and the equations, I think, are absolutely fundamental. But a lot of people had more successful eco-socialist lifestyles and behaviors and relationships to phenomena than through this model of kind of the dominant modern scientific method of reductionism. So I'm a bit worried about a desire to overmodel the biosphere when we can rather build culture and of intuitions that serve us better than the model? I think we do both. <laughs> both are necessary. Uh, we shouldn't suspend the scientific research, which enriches our knowledge. But at the same time, we need, as you, I think, imply, we need to create prefigurations of the future. Prefigurations, that is, uh, living models of what the world we want to make, cooperative, uh, solar co-ops and this sort of thing and agroecology and so forth and socially cooperation. So uh, again, lifestyle, we can come back to the issue. I want to later on address what is a strategy that I think is necessary to have any chance of preventing the uh, warming of our climate above one and a half degree. We need a strategy to do that. So I'll get into that a little later if you be patient. Um, let me just finish this up. So I, did, I have papers on lichens. Lichens are one of my favorite organisms. They, you'll see them in, uh, growing on the rock, on trees in Central Park, right, Prospect Park. They're a symbiotic relationship between a photosynthesizer and a fungus. Okay, and I won't say more about that, but there's a lot. And then even, how did big brain animals emerge on our planet? We, our brains are very energy intensive. That means we give off heat. If the climate is too hot, big brain would not, would be blocked from emerging. Now that's not to say that Homo sapiens originated in Northern Europe at all. They originated in Africa, but uh, we've we've argued in papers that, that during the glacial periods of the Pleistocene, there were about five glacial periods over the last two mil, almost three million years. That this coincided with the emergence of. In our, in our lineage, Homo erectus and so forth, that they 
emerged when the climate actually cooled, mainly in Africa, a few degrees, to allow the dissipation of heat from the brain. Otherwise, the brain, you, the brain would be cooked. So it's not the only factor, but that was research that I've done. Now, getting to the energy system. So I'll get into the thermodynamics of communism and, re, and this that uh, Said already mentioned. So next, next slide. So I tried also connecting the two uh, using, I mentioned lichens. Lichens can also serve as biomonitors of air pollution and particularly heavy metals. They, they accumulate heavy metals actually like an ion exchanger plus particles of you know, particulate matter. But we did modeling of this. And also I did a study on isotopic tracing of lead in gasoline in children's blood in DC. The, and isotopes of lead, that's a long story, but uh, that's how Claire Patterson determined the age of the earth hmm. in the mid fifties by, this is what he did. He said, what did they, what, um, I, lead, the element leads have several isotopes, that is different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. Okay. And some of lead 204 has no parent, radioactive parent, but lead, the other isotopes do, uranium decays to lead 207, okay, and lead 206. Uh, thorium decays to 208, as I recall. Anyway, those, the amount of those isotopes have increased in the Earth. So Claire Patterson determined the age of Earth by looking at modern lead, the isotopic composition of modern lead, and did a growth curve from what the earth began. Well, what did the earth begin with? With lead in basically iron meteorites, which have no uranium or thorium. So he went into the lab, and this is the connection to the pervasive pollution of our biosphere with lead from burning lead or gasoline. If the windows of his lab were open, he would contaminate the lead that was in the meteorite. He would be measuring monolead instead of the primitive lead that the earth started with. And he realized he had to filter the air and use re very pure reagents to determine it. And then he found that even the ocean, the lead in the ocean, even very low levels were contaminated with anthropogenic lead. It's in the snows of Antarctica and the and um, and the Arctic. This the lead from burning gasoline, which comes from lead deposits, which have a distinctive lead composition, isotopic composition. So that's how we use to trace to estimate how much of the lead in children's blood actually came from burning less lead gasoline in the environment. Uh, we used air filters to determine the ambient lead. So just to, next slide. Um, okay, and I, I already discussed this, next slide. All right, how do I approach biology, chemistry, and energy of the Marxist? That was your original question. Right? Yeah, you've covered it. Um, uh, back, back. If you want to talk about, you know, given the time frame that we have at our disposal, if you could connect with um, the possibilities of renewable energy, Basically, yeah, and um, particularly solar energy under capitalism and what potential for solar energy oh, do we have in an organized socialist system okay. or in a society okay. organized as a socialist system? Uh, give me the next slide, that's it. All right, so this is where thermodynamics comes in. And my paper, Solar Communism, I actually came up with this idea in 1992. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, uh, that, that communism has to be rethought for the 21st century. What's the energy source for society? Can it be fossil fuel or fission? No, 
I argue it needs to be renewable energy, which is in one hour, the earth gets the equivalent of energy to its surface, the land surface, that all of civilization consumes in one year. In one, in one hour. In one hour. Now, the challenge is to efficiently capture it. You're not going to do that with biofuel, which is low efficiency, right? Growing plants to and then use it as fuel. You're going to, there are three main ways photovoltaics, wind energy, and concentrated solar power in deserts, where you have big parabolic reflectors that heat up a fluid in the pipe and then it drives a turbine producing electricity. Uh, they have great potential, uh, but of course there's issues with all of them. Nevertheless, I, I came up with a new formulation of communism from Marx. I mean, Marx said communism is from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. I said, no, you say her, not him which now refers to humans, but to nature. Okay, so we, we have to, we have the responsibility to take care of the biosphere. There's no part of the biosphere that's been untouched by human effect. Even the deep sea trenches, there's plastics that have come down. Uh, the anthropogenic rise in CO2 has affected the whole biosphere. There's no part of the biosphere that's untouched. Nevertheless, we have the responsibility, I would argue, to preserve the maximum biodiversity and even possibly restore some. Maybe, maybe I don't think we'll get to restore the passenger pigeon, who knows, or a man, woolly mammoth people even thinking of getting more, <laughs> using the DNA from the frozen woolly mammoths and uh, putting them in an elephant and getting a, another one. No, I'm basically, we need to maximize the uh, bio, biodiversity of the planet. It has huge intrinsic value and practical value at the same time to civilization. Okay, both. So that's where I let that led me to that's what motivated me to go to the foundation of thermodynamics and and critique uh, a very influential person who was uh, regarded as the father of ecological economics, Georgesco Rogat. He wrote a book called The Entropy Law back in around 1970. Okay, so this is what these books were about. Next slide. Oh, this was my thesis on biospheric evolution. Uh, it was just a sample that that I I saw the I argued that the biosphere is a self-organizing whole. And we have to account for how that influences the parts and how there's a feedback between the two. That's the dialectics of the biosphere evolution. So I won't read all of this. Yeah, again, I'll send you a PDF. Next one. All right, so now we come to your question about renewable energy. Okay, what is the potential of solar? And I started to talk about this. Now, we need to accelerate the siting of renewable energy. But if we just do that, we'll be doomed by catastrophic climate change. When I say catastrophic climate change, we already see it, but much worse catastrophic climate change. It's a matter of degree. And uh, a lot of work has shown that uh, if we breach the one and a half degree, then tipping points to much worse consequences kick in. Okay, it's not two degrees warming, it's one and a half degree. We're about 1.2 now degrees above the pre 
industrial level. Okay, so we're very close, but don't give up hope. So we need to curb fossil fuel carbon emissions that essentially terminate the burning of fossil fuel on our planet and address the non-carbon greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide, which industrial agriculture uses a lot of nitrate fertilizer that's industrially produced, okay? Basically, it was produced by uh, way back in the early 20th century for, what was the name of the scientist? I forget. Liebig? Liebig? Are you talking about Liebig? The guy that uh, developed the process. Oh, uh, Haber-Bosch. Haber-Bosch. It's the Haber-Bosch process. Haber, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in any case, that was for the German war effort in World War I because nitrates are and greening and gunpowder. But then, again, that with the green, so-called green revolution, huge increase in use of nitrate fertilizer, but the nitrates break down in soil and water and it produces nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. It's a trace gas, but it's still significant. And it also leads to over-fertilization of water supply, dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico and so on. It has a lot of consequences. So here's the political challenge that I argue we have to defeat fossil capital and its political instruments. That's our chief po political challenge because unless we defeat them, we cannot curb the burning of fossil fuel on our planet. And guess who's doing it? Fossil capital is rebounded since the Ukraine war. You have on both sides. Right? Uh, Russia is now embracing Saudi Arabia, by the way, and the Saudis are going to uh, invest in development of new oil extraction in Russia. So the fossil capital collaborates and they will, they don't give a damn what the long term consequences are. They want to get profits. And it's, it's the dynamics of reproduction of fossil capital. I'm not going to personalize it somewhere. So I would argue that the only strategy that has any plausibility is to unfold the Green New Deal starting under capitalism. I know uh, people say, oh, how are we going to solve this? Well, we have to have socialism instead of capitalism. Oh, that's a good idea, but how are you going to get there? How are you going to create the, the political capacity and strength of the organized working class to push to end the rule of capital on our planet and its allies? That's a cha political challenge we have. We have to begin to curb fossil capital under capitalism. We have no chance of waiting several decades and praying that, uh, oh, socialism will suddenly come down from the sky. We, it's a, it's a, this is the political challenge we face, and we, I'll get into that some more. So I would argue the, qua, the quantity and quality of energy is fundamental. And uh, this has to do with the thermodynamics of co communism. I call it the thermodynamics of communism. That's thermodynamics, real thermodynamics, applied to unfolding a agenda, an eco-socialist agenda that will lead to solar communism as a global system. Next slide. So I argue we need a reload Lenin. Well, both of them, John Lenin too. Imagine, <laughs> right? We need to imagine a different future, but this Lenin utilizes the divisions of capital and to defeat fossil capital is to open this path. So green capital, and what I mean by green capital, obviously most of the uh, renewable energy being cited in the world today, and it's growing significantly, is by green capital, okay? 
even China, which is a leader of producing uh, renewable energy technology, that's still capital reproduction. Okay, it's you could call it socialism. It is state capitalism, socialism, as Richard Wolf liked to say, right? China is socialist because it's state capitalist. <laughs> it's a pro. He sees that as the first state. No, it is capitalism with socialist characteristics. That the Chinese leadership says socialism with Chinese characteristics, right? <laughs> but so we need to ally in the beginning to defeat fossil capital, and then recognize that green capital is a driver of extractive assault on humans and nature, right? If we leave it to green capital, they don't give a damn how many mines they open up, how much pollution they cause, as long as they get profit, right? Mainly in the global south, insult, the insult on indigenous people that are no, largely affected by this mining. So that's the, the contradiction we face, the challenge we face. Next slide. So I would, I've argued, how do we prevent climate catastrophe or worse? That is over one half degree. Global demilitarization, no more wars. Okay, even Science Magazine in April recognized that. We're not gonna have any chance of addressing the climate challenge unless we have peace. And they argue US and China should cooperate. This is Science Magazine editorial. They recognize that. People, any sane person on this planet recognizes that, I think. So we got to demilitarize because we can't create cooperation that's necessary globally unless we stop these perpetual wars that are driven by militarized fossil capital. That's who's driving these wars. So we have to defeat that and defeat them, solarize energy and replace industrial and GMO agriculture with ecological agriculture, okay? and. We need to have the capacity to eliminate energy poverty, which mainly affects most of the people in the world and I'll, I'll, that live lower life expectancy because they don't have enough energy. I'll give you an example. Uh, and that degrowth is like the point to Cuba. Oh, Cuba, if the global South had the same energy consumption or GMP as Cuba, they do very well. They have a satisfactory life. What does that mean? Okay, they'll live to 78. That's not the highest life expectancy in the world. It's like over 80. Oh, but you know, we'll let the people in the global south live a somewhat shorter life. They'd be happy with that. That's the uh, Eurocentrism of the degrowthists, in my opinion, that we need to we need to fight for the highest quality of life and life expectancy of everyone living on the planet, every child on the planet. David, I'm, I'm sorry. It. David, I'm sorry. Yeah. We're, we're very short on time. You probably would want to add that the lifting the blockade is, a, is essential in order for Cuban living standards to be raised as well. But uh, well, yes, yeah. I, that's the point. Cuba is. But, but our time is rather limited, I'm afraid. We, no, yeah. that's true. I mean, Cuba is doing exceptionally well under the constraints of the U.S. imperialist embargo that's universally condemned in the world. There are only two countries voting to keep the embargo, U.S. and Israel, in the latest vote. Two, in the whole world. All the U.S. allies voted to end. So that Cuba is uh, consuming a little over one kilowatt per person. That's power. Multiplied by time, you get how much energy per person. And that's insufficient to live to the highest life expectancy. So Cuba is 49th in the world in life expectancy, just above the United States, by the way. They have a higher life expectancy than the United States, mainly because they dealt much more effectively with COVID pandemic than the US. And Ophi had, of course, killing off people in the US. So Cuba actually does better than the United States in life expectancy and also infant mortality.
uh, but they could they could be the top in the world if they had sufficient energy and renewable energy in particular. So, David, I'm sorry, but in, so, if you could if you could give some we, a concluding remark because we are, we're running out of time. I'm sorry. Oh, we are. Yeah. It's a quarter and six. Yeah, well, we, we got forty five minutes. Uh, Actually, All right, you tell we me. have we have questions know. that we we'd like to open up for questions. Let so, me, uh, yeah, let, I've already covered this. Thanks. We also need more energy to climate adaptation and mitigation than we now consume, and not degrow the whole world. We have that more energy in the form of solar in order to address climate adaptation. Look, look at people are dying from heat stress right now. It's going to get worse. We need energy to cool the environments that people live in, plus mitigation, and we'll come to that. Next slide. All right, now you wanted a model of renewable energy. How would we do this in our age paper? Uh, okay, the M is the energy return of energy invested, divided by the lifetime of the renewable. So this is sort of the instantaneous production of renewable energy from itself. In other words, renewable reproduces itself. F is the fraction of renewable invested to make more of itself. That's the key to the exponential growth of renewable energy. As you increase this, you increase the production. Now, you also have to start with what we have. 80% of the global energy comes from fossil fuel now. We use a small proportion of that to make more to make renewable energy. The, the fossil fuel of choice really is conventional oil that has the lowest greenhouse gas footprint. The highest is actually natural gas and coal. Natural gas because it leaks right to the atmosphere, it's methane, very potent greenhouse gas. So that's being appreciated now. Uh, and Anyway, that, that's the essence of the formula. Next slide. So as I said, we grow the renewable supply with a modest contribution, only a few percent of the fossil fuel every year that's being produced is necessary in this production. We can leave most of the fossil fuel in the crust I don't like this slogan, keep the oil in the soil. You've heard that on demonstration, right? Keep the oil in the soil. I told my other demonstrator, well, if you put it in the soil, you can't grow anything. What they mean, obviously, keep it in this sedimentary rock. Don't extract it. And there should be no new fossil fuel extraction. That's a struggle. No new fossil fuel extraction. That doesn't mean shutting, we can't simply shut down all production of fossil fuel. We'll have no energy to do the transition. Plus we'll plunge most of the people in the world in much more severe energy poverty than they do now. We simply can't say, keep it all in the ground. We have to use a small fraction and that's where oil producing countries have a role in this cooperation to supply the fossil fuel with the lowest greenhouse gas footprint, and that's conventional oil, a small amount will allow itself to do away with itself, to terminate all fossil fuel. Okay, next, next slide. So this is, a, this is one of the simulations what's run in the paper. And this is just a fraction of the existing fossil of the renewable that's used to make more of itself. So even with, with let's say, 15%, we get two times the, the energy that we have now in the world. That's probably even more than we need. In other words, these simulations were done to show that it's possible to, with existing technology, that is solar technology and wind, which will only get more efficient, like new wind turbines that are much more efficient than the older ones, 
and photovoltaics and moving to technologies that use doesn't use very rare elements that need to be mined, but more abundant elements that would include in batteries and so on. Next slide. So this was a question from Saeed that I try to address. Uh, how do we spot pro-capitalist bias or political consequential assumptions in the mathematical models? Okay, so this was in our paper. All the studies previously of renewable energy transition that we looked at were very complicated. They based on market-based economics. Okay, that's what informed the IPCC modeling. All right, they don't, they're not talking about demilitarizing the whole economy. They're not talking about moving to an eco-socialist political economy. No, they're saying, well, market capitalism, let's see what it could do. That's what's embedded in their modeling. Okay, and this was an example of Prometheus modeling. So even pricing of fuel, fossil fuel, okay, the pricing of fossil fuel, okay, under a market economy, that we can't accept that kind of. We based our, our simulation on a physical modeling based on what the available technology could do now, what is possible, the available. So the physical, that's the physical economy. And we have to transform the political economy to make that possible. That's the challenge. That's the defeat of fossil capital and then the defeat of green capital in the future, right? The defeat of all capital to make a socially managed global civilization that uh, we've been talking about. So Nick, I hope I address that question. Yeah, okay, next one. All right, a little bit about the thermodynamics of co communism. Next slide. So I referred to G Georgesco again. This is entropy law. It's underpinning a lot of still th uh, prominent advocates in the deep growth area, which uh, Said and I critiqued in CNS, by the way. And here's the, uh, here's the article. Oh no, that's not, that's the one I did. Uh, that's the later one. Okay, next one. Next slide. All right, the misleading spectra of entropy. Next slide. So what is it? All right, he claimed to discover a fourth law of thermodynamics. He said, this is one of his formulations. Unavailable matter cannot be recycled. B, a closed system, that is a system that cannot exchange matter with the environment, cannot perform work indefinitely at a constant rate. Well, indeed, if you use fossil fuel, that's in a closed system. That is mining it from the crust and we'll run out of fossil fuel eventually. Of course, we'll be, we'll, we'll, uh, be uh, killed off by catastrophic climate change before that. So it's not possible. Uh, however, what he confused a closed system with an isolated system. The Earth's surface is not isolated. Yes, effectively, yeah, meteorites come down a few thousand tons a year. That's insignificant. A volcano is erupt from the mantle. Yeah, but overall, the, the, the surface is essentially close to matter transfer from outside. A basic, a good first approximation, but certainly not to energy because the sun's energy comes in continuously and then escapes as waste heat. Okay, so that's how that's the fundamental problem with this law of thermodynamics. It's fallacious. I'm not the only one to recognize this. Okay, so but it still underpins this. A new book by some German authors called The Futurist Degrowth. Verso published that. Did not. And I was there. It just quotes your Jesco again. No critique of it. They don't, 
Unfortunately, none of them were physical natural scientists. Why didn't they even examine the critiques of this fallacious law? I asked. So next slide. So the Earth's surface is open from space. And so global solar power will then pay its entropic debt, that is, non incremental waste heat without driving us to catastrophic climate change. And also at the same time, this is very important, as we build renewable energy, then we build the capacity to recycle metals instead of mining them. Okay, because recycling with fossil fuel, obviously it has negative impacts. And this, this is true because if we didn't tap the solar energy, we basically have the same waste heat to space anyway, because the reflectivity of the Earth's surface is not significantly changed by building solar. Okay, so it's the same flux of waste heat without having the consequences of anthropogenic global warming and even the urban heat island, you know, from that we experience from uh, energy consumption in urban areas. Next slide. Here's another one. Commonly you hear, this is Jordan Mombiat from The Guardian. Uh, Perpetual growth of the finite planet leads to environmental calamity. All right, this is the degrowth is like this, but what what is the growth they're talking about? What growth? All growth? Is there good growth and bad growth? Next slide. So I already put this out. Solar energy is fundamental. Next slide. Next one. So he was a, basically, he dismissed solar energy as not viable. He said it couldn't replace the first. So, and they're still repeating this of baloney too now. Yeah, yeah. David, next slide. We actually have a few questions. I don't know if this is a good, a oh, good point go. to bring them in. Next slide. Next. Yeah, we have questions also from the, from right, the, from the online I'm audience. So. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So uh, give me uh, five more minutes and I'll be. So what should grow? This was, uh, came out in 2011. We grow stuff that leads to the satisfaction of real needs. And degrow, obviously, and terminate the military industrial complex, right? We, de we degrow and eliminate the bad growth and grow the good growth. Next slide. And of course, the global north needs to degrow because we have a lot of wasteful consumption of energy. I mentioned Cuba is one low over one kilowatt per person. The U.S. is about over nine. All we need for uh, for its highest life expectancy is about three kilowatt per person. Now it'll go down in the future. Next, and of course, the global north has to be challenged to since it's responsible for the prospect, the threat of catastrophic climate change, they must be challenged to finance and help building solar in the global south. Next. All right, this has to be throughput. I could skip over this one. And uh, I just want to point out that if we demilitarize the global economy and get to, and move away from fossil fuel, we have a huge material infrastructure that we can recycle into creating a green economy. There's metals like aerospace, right? Well, metals that are needed in constructing the renewable technologies without mining it, okay? So there are opportunities when we build the solar. Next. All right, I already pointed out about Cuba, next one. All right, so I would say degrowth in a plan, and the degrowers like Callis and Hickel say we, the globe has to decrease its energy consumption, the globe. No, that's a prospect for 
ecocide and human suicide because we won't have the capacity to deal with energy poverty, particularly in the global south. It'll just make it worse. And we won't have the capacity for climate adaptation mitigation. Okay, so de just degrowing everything globally and going back to an agricultural economy with uh, using plants as energy is a prospect of suicide for most of the people in the world. Okay, that's that's a that's my view. <laughs> Next. <laughs> So here's the real child, I'll skip over this. Okay, skip, next one. There's details here. So I would say eliminating money, increasing recycling, using wind and solar will be a, make possible transition to a steady state economy in the future. Next slide. Okay, this, this is, Repeating what I said. This is more material to get deeper in if you want to get deeper in the subject. Next slide. So here's the Global Green New Deal. Get, now I'll be finished in a moment. So here's the uh, the, the wise guy from the pedagogy of you know, hope. Hello for Aaron. What can we do now in order to be able to do tomorrow what we are able unable to do today, okay? In other words, politically create the conditions that we can move forward. You don't get everything all at once. Um, uh, even though some of the far left said, well, we got to do away with capitalism. Okay, how are you going to do it? <laughs> I'm for that, but how we, what, let's think through a strategy to make that possible. Next slide. Next slide is from Great science fiction writer, Kim Stanley Robinson, Ministry for the Future. Read that book. It's a great book. Because he outlines that basically an eco-social transition this century. It's a novel, but it has great ideas. So he says, we, we fight austerity neoliberalism and start with Keynesian stimulus and then move forward. Next slide. Let, next to last. Uh, so we map out a path to a Green New Deal and leave fossil capital in prehistory, as Mark said, where it deserves to be. Next slide. And next slide. So these are potential stages. Start with neo Keynesian approach that is investing, like to some degree, what happened in the pandemic but investing in the good stuff that, and then defeat fossil capital and move forward. And the key is to build the capacity of the organized working class to have the strength to move it forward. And not only organize the organized working class of the world, we're talking about a transnational movement with important allies, indigenous people in particular, women's organizations all over the world and so on. All of these have to be coordinated in a global, and that's what our, uh, one of our papers in the special body. So I'm on, at near the end, next slide, the last, oh, I, and I'll skip that over. And, uh, oh, I already dealt with that. <laughs> next slide. This is our book website. We have a lot on it. And uh, again, I'll send you a PDF. <laughs> you, know, you don't like to look at your know, download a PDF, I see. But <laughs> you could put a photograph. Next slide. So this is my final advice. Be as radical as reality itself, like a radish. Rad radical and radish have the same root. That's my logo, a radish. Next slide. And these are some of the readings. And I'll just point to this one. And we have five copies, and I'll conclude with this. These, um, it, uh, I'm trying to raise money for the journal. So if you have five bucks, if you can afford it, you get a copy. If you can't, you get a copy, okay? From each according to her ability to each according to her needs, okay? 
So uh, I hope there's some good critical questions now. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, we have, I'm sure, some questions online at the very least, hopefully among you as well. And I hope I can hear people. Hmm. Question, just raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone over so that our uh, friends online can hear you. Um, hello. Uh, so in one of the documents that we read uh, for the uh, the second one, there was like a study. It was about, it had a part about circular uh, economy being created through this. And I'm just curious about some of the logistics of that. Yes. Well, another word for that is industrial ecologies. In other words, you use the waste products of a certain production as a raw material for another. So again, it, 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 it reduces extractivism, right, and mining. It's possible now, but it will be greatly enhanced with renewable energy to make that possible. And, and that was mentioned in our paper, by the way, but uh, the AIDS paper. But it is, again, it's a prefiguration. I call myself a blocking Marxist. Ernst Bloch, The Principle of Hope, a great text where he wrote about prefiguration, both materially and culturally. And it's a very important concept, I think, that should form our eco social agenda. That is, create as much as we can, you know, actual models of how the future would be. But don't assume that this will be the only path. We're not going to defeat fossil capital just by creating these prefiguration, but it inspires people and gives a material uh, you know, benefit to people at the same time, inspires people to cooperate on, on a national and global level to actually move the whole political economy vote different, you know. You have a question here. Can you raise your hand if you have a question? I'm just getting close because I'm a little hard to hear. So. No problem. Uh, thanks. Um, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian. South Africa is my context, right? And uh, this debate is very alive. Um, I have two quick questions for you. The first one is about this gr global Green New Deal, as you say. To me, that sounds like quite a US framing. Why do you say New Deal is? something very particular to this context. What's the utility in utilizing that given what happened with the New Deal and, and the victories that came, the victories and losses that came out of that. The second one is about, you made a quite a controversial statement about, uh, you know, green capital is an early ally against fossil capital. Yeah. So in South Africa, green cap, green capital, some of it overlaps. World Bank and IMF heavily, involved, heavily invested in coal and heavily invested in renewables. The second part of it is that most of the green capital is actually privatizing our energy system. Mm -hmm. And state-owned energy is mainly fossil and some fission. And some of the most radical unions are in the coal sector okay. and in the nuclear energy sector. And mm -hmm. so there's a split. Much of civil society is influenced by democratic socialist ideals from places like this. And you have sections of the traditional labor movement that have a, hold a different view, but are open to other alternatives. Mm -hmm. right? You also have other kinds of tendencies too, mm -hmm. but you have that red green split. So in that situation, if you say green capital is an early ally, you are effectively saying that we should allow a temporary privatization of our energy system. That's, that's, that's the juncture that we sit at, you know? So can you mm -hmm. comment on, you? Yeah, it's a provocative good. statement you made and can you qualify that? Absolutely, very good points you're making. Uh, first, uh, the different version of Green New Deal. Max Agel has published the People's Green New Deal. And we uh, actually praise it in our article in Sun Society because he brings in the importance of bringing in an anti-imperialist aspect to promoting Green New Deal, which is essential for demil demilitarization to allow this cooperation and stopping the wars, um, along with other aspects like the extractivist assault on people in the global south. So he makes some very good points. I'm critical of this 
adoption of the degrowth, but that's just a small part of what he said. So I think it's an excellent uh, account of the Green New Deal that we should work for, but we're not going to get that immediately. Okay, what I'm suggesting is that we have to create the basis to move forward to a better, a better stage first. It's better even, uh, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders had a, the best Green New Deal nationally, right? Even including some demobilization, and he improved on AOC version, which even included nuclear power. So they're different versions. Europe has some proposals, and other all over the world, they're different versions. Have to be, look critically. What is it really doing? As you pointed, as far as green capital, yeah, there's a lot of contradictions. I I may I stress that it's green capital that's actually building renewable, not the green capital that overlaps with fossil fuel production, continuing that. And of course, there are corporations that do both, as you point out. So it's a political challenge to that I think we're going to have to confront, because unless we have that ally, I don't think we're going to defeat fossil capital in time to keep below the one and a half degree target. We need to use the allies that are available as problematic as they are and work through those contradictions. I, uh, by the way, I just saw a article about a woman in South Africa that's in a uh, more suburban community that facing, uh, you know, power failures, and she's working on decentralized solar. I think that's an important approach to, uh, along with uh, pushing for nationalization of the energy. And, and so it could be more socially managed to push it in a renewable direction away from fossil fuel. I mean, all that's a again a political challenge, but I'm glad you raised that. It's it's a lot of contradiction. Other question? I don't have all the answers to it. You know, <laughs> it, there's a lot of research and work that needs to be done to in this strategy. That's for you, everyone, to address potentially. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, you you mentioned. Uh, once or twice Marx's uh, definition of communism uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Uh, but this uh, lecture, it, it really evokes Lenin's uh, slogan on the foundation of Goelra. Uh, uh, communism is Soviet power plus electrification. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it because uh, the, the core of, of what he said and what what's being elaborated here for the in the context of green transition is that the the infrastructure of an electrified economy or a green powered economy uh, lends itself to social ownership socialism um potentially but uh, yes of course um yeah. could, uh, could uh, is there a similar thing to be said about the, the other facets of uh for example preserving the biodiversity uh, prevention of new pathogens the other things that are lumped into this green transition. Yeah, uh, matter of fact, electrification. Um, the Jacobson lab in Stanford has a lot of really good studies on electrification using renewable globally in each country. However, they, they don't produce enough energy. They don't produce enough energy for climate adaptation and mitigation. Okay, so there are plans for complete electrification, but I think they need to go further. Matter of fact, I, my oldest son just informed me of a book called Electrify. I forget the author, but it's from the synopsis of the book, it's just, oh, well, green capital will electrify everything. And, you know, so it's not a critique of political economy, it just assumes that if we rely on 
bring capital, it will deliver the future. I don't believe that's going to happen. Okay, we have, we have to defeat fossil capital and eventually defeat green capital too. I mean, you know, for to green capital also, there's no automatic protection of the workforce, which we see now. It's not, it's not well organized and that, that uh, labor organized. So that has to happen in this transition. You know, potentially, um, I would recommend a book. I was on the book panel at the, in London at the Historical Materialism Conference just a few weeks ago. And a book called by Matt Huber called Climate Change as um, Class War. That's a title book. And it's, it, it, it deals with centrally the role of the working class and taking leadership because he's critical of the what he called the professional class, the NGOs and so on leading this and uh, mainly with the degrowth attitude and not addressing the material interests of the working class that we have to win to succeed. Okay, the work, working class has great benefits in health, in jobs, and shorter workday, and so forth, in a solar transition, potentially. You know, cleaner air, cleaner water, better food, right? A future for their children. That should be on, front and center on our agenda. Anyway, I'm getting off your question. Well, Sorry, I should leave more time. We have one, two, uh, and then we have a few more questions online. I'm going to start in the back and then come to you. Uh, you want to come forward so you can. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so this is sort of building off of the comment that Brian made, um, but it's in a U.S. context. Yeah. Um, I think also about the the statement you made about um, green capitalism as an early ally. You know, my experience in the United States is that um, because of the long history, the decades of a neoliberal agenda and the really like weakening of political consciousness in this country, that the options offered to um, local communities, communities of color, working class communities, are within the framework of uh, a neoliberal energy yeah. set of neoliberal, neoliberal energy policies. Right. And in the context of renewable energy that comes in the form of um, giving communities the option to buy into community energy through a subsidies model that is that really entrenches them further into a for-profit privatized model of renewable energy. And because of the weakness of our general political uh, consciousness in this country, it I think it really tethers our communities to these neoliberal models and then entrenches us in uh, defending those models mm -hmm. rather than actually fighting for nationalized systems or public systems where communities can be engaged through governance, through conservation related to, de you know, growth, um, but not necessary and, and potentially, you know, with organizations around, um, you know, decision-making processes and all that. But, but I think the framing of the early allyship um, within a green capitalist model is, is mis misleading because I think what it has done actually is forced, uh, forced a different set of, um, well, basically it's like entrenched people further into the kinds of policies we don't want furthering capital in the service of capitalism. So yeah, that's, well, I yeah. I think you're make, I mean. making a very critical point. I think that's actually a 
very accurate. Uh, in DC, our distributor of energy is, of electrical energy is PEPCO, which is owned by the Exelon Corporation, which is a nuclear power. We had a big struggle to block the takeover of PEPCO, but we lost, by Exelon, we lost it. So there's struggles going on, speaking from my experience in DC, and there's a strong solar movement in DC, uh, and PEPCO is now blocking and creating obstacles for the solar for all program that the DC government has to actually provide free photovoltaics to people all over the community. So the, the solar community, I call it the justice community, have been fighting this struggle that you're alluding to, actually, that you're describing. And it's not one, but the, to recognize these contradictions is essential because our DC government is dominated by neoliberal Democrats who, by the way, we, I'll give you one example of how on the failure of their policies, the life expectancy gap between black and white residents in DC has actually grown in the last 20 years. Not shrunk, grown. Black men in 2016 lived 17 years shorter lives than white men in DC and women 12. And now it's even greater gap because of the pandemic. So uh, we have a political challenge. I'm in the local affiliate of the Green Party, the state of the Green Party, and we're challenging the neoliberal Democrats. So we need a political challenge to make this transition socially managed and put green capital, if it's an ally, in a position where the movement dominates the agenda, right? So again, it's, uh, it's very important what you brought out. I think uh, the defeat of neoliberal, neoliberalism is central to what we face in, the, in, in not only the US, but the whole world, really. Uh, but it, uh, we have opportunities, though, I think to move forward because and I should mention I'm a member of DSA, the Metro DC DSA, Democrat Social America. I joined right after Trump was elected the first time. I always thought DSA was too moderate, but uh, they're pretty radical now. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I joined and it's mainly young people, but they have a project called We Power DC which is to municipalize the energy supply of DC, the utilities, that is taking over washing and gas, and we should actually electrify away from gas, right? That should, that should, that's, a com that's a challenge we have all over because it's leaking right out of the streets. Methane is leaking from old pipes. Mm. And, uh, uh, there's actually a program to give free electrification to low-income people in D.C. That's on the agenda. It's not necessarily going to pass immediately, but that's We Power D.C. is a project of DSA to municipalize the energy supply. So again, the political economy and the physical economy, we need a couple both together. You know, and don't pretend we just go dress one. One more question. All right, thank you. Hello, oh, thank you. Um, my name is Nino, I'm an organizer with uh, the Party for Socialism and Liberation. You might know my comrade, Eugene Perrier. He ran for, yeah. I ran with him uh, in 2014. He ran for council at large, I ran for, the shadow Senate. There you go. The comrade. <laughs> I know you look familiar. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh uh dang, what was I gonna say? Um oh wait, so basically, you know, you had mentioned that Paulo Ferry quote about what we can do today to help us prepare for tomorrow, that to do what we couldn't do today. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned political economy, and I guess my question is uh how has your research engaged with 
actually existing socialist projects, if we may deem them as such, right? Uh, from as far as Nicaragua to Bolivia to China, uh, Vietnam and so on. Um, because, you know, I see that as embodying that quote, right? Because, you know, his brother had mentioned the New Deal, which, you know, has very, very ma ma major contradictions, you know, particularly for Black people. And uh, so I think about, I don't think about that framework as a, as a communist today. I think of like the frameworks that have actually defeated capitalism. And, you know, you mentioned the stages of modern Keynesianism or moderate Keynesianism and however you say his name. And, um, you know, to me that, I don't know if you, you know, you mentioned, you also mentioned, mentioned Lenin. I don't know, I, I'm a Leninist and that kind of stageism of like, first we do this, then we do this. I feel like there's, it's more likely that there'll be a radical rupture where we'll be forced to leap into a new set of political consequences where if we have political power, why be moderate about it? Why not just, yes. But like, if we, if we want, if, if we know that a revolution is going to get us to have power, right? Once we had, well, I guess, yeah, you're probably saying like, before we have power, we should like, you know, be a, a lobby to make modern, moderate Keynesianism a thing. I, do you think that's actually realistic and likely given just like the last 10, 20 years of social and political explosions in the United States with no, like the right wing seems more revolutionary, right? They're like storming the Capitol. Mm -hmm. They almost actually seize power. And if they have that political, if they have that political horizon where they could actually take state power, why not us, right? Um, so I guess the question is, well, how has your research engaged you know, those socialist projects. Um, and I guess like, do you see that as like stagism if, or, you know, with the moderate Keynesianism leading up to et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, that's, a, yeah, I, I'm familiar with PSL's thinking on that. And uh, I'm critical of their strategic view, even though I have a lot in common with the comrades. Um, the first thing, our book, in terms of engaging with uh, experiments elsewhere, we have a whole chapter about Cuba, where my son and I visited Cuba in 2017, and uh, we have a you know what the experiences are in terms of agroecology. We went on an agro ecological tour. They have cooperatives, and so on. So we try to bring that experience, you know, to, in our book. Um, we, uh, we also, uh, I'm not directly active in it, but Howard University started a appropriate technology group, which a lot of my friends are in, and I went to one meeting in South Africa, but uh, they're holding international conferences on appropriate technology, mainly by, from people from the global south to apply renewable energy and so forth, you know, to uh, promote that. So these experiences are very valuable and to learn from that. Uh, we, I also participated in Venezuela with Saeed at the first Eco-Socialist International Convocation <laughs> in Venezuela, um, up in the mountains there. It was an interesting experience. <laughs> yeah, I should say. <laughs> but uh, again, it's addressed the second part. Now, what did Lenin, what did Lenin think that you, that the Soviets would go directly to communism? Or what was the first stage that they actually went through to recover from the assault from 14 country, capitalist countries that invaded and all the destruction? Okay, they did, they, they, they had, they actually had foreign capitalists invest in that period. Okay, so they, that was the context there. What is our context? Our context in the, is that we don't have political power. The organized working class is weak. Okay, that's apparent. Although there's very promising developments in organizing, right? But the trade unions are weak. 
I th and unless we build that political capacity, we're not going to be able to have a revolution and jump. I think the point that you're making, and one of the slides I skipped over was, and I was actually quoting from Jody Dean, who's a member of PSL, and a paper she did with uh, Heron about this process could be very nonlinear. Yes, indeed, we can't anticipate the leaps, but we can anticipate how the challenge to build the political strength of the working class and how that, that is a precondition, I think, for any kind of revolutionary change. And that's a big challenge. Education, political education and experience, you know, that your party is involved in and other pa parties are involved in it too, in organizing and political education. I'm associate, I'm giving a class with the Claudia Jones School for Political Education, which is CP led in DC on actually in a week from now. <laughs> um, on basically eco socialism. I did a class on the struggle for statehood in DC and how that's related to building working class power. If you're interested, I have a link I can send you. Just send me an email. But uh, I don't, I think it's, we can anticipate the revolutionary rupture. We should. But how do we? create the conditions for that to make that possible. I don't think we have those conditions now in the United States, given the uh, weakness of uh, the domination by uh, a neoliberal Democratic Party. Indeed, it does have some left uh, elements that are pushing it, right? But it's still dominated by neoliberal imperialist Think agenda. We recognize that. Uh, I think it's preferable to a neo fascist Republican Party because we won't have the ability, if they take over, it'll set everything back a lot in terms of having the chance to deliver material benefits to the working class. I'll give you one example, Expand, extending the childhood tax credit, which is being blocked. That is really reduced poverty in the United States. It had a major impact. And we have to recognize that that's a benefit for the working class. We have to stand with the working class and, 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 and not say, oh, well, the Democrats are doing it, so it can't be good. That's, that's, that, that isolates us from the working class. They, so we need to recognize the, uh, the ability to get gains, not as much as we need by any means, but to push it forward. And even the um, Inflation Reduction Act, mm -hmm. right? It was pretty weak. Right, but there are some benefits. Electric utilities around the country are now moving more vigorously to renewable energy. Okay, it does have the other contradictions. The green capitalists mainly are using it to speculate on the market and get a lot of money. Right, so these contradictions have to be analyzed. And uh, so on. So I'm glad you asked that question, Comrade. <laughs> uh, and and with that, a lot to discuss we, in we, we certainly, I, uh, I hope that we will. Oh, uh, and we announced this uh, mm -hmm. this issue again has uh, several good articles, a lot of good articles, and what the one that uh, Sayin and I did, we did an introduction, and then. Uh, Patrick Vaughn has a great article about the climate crisis and our great comrades about energy transitions and Matt Hooper, I mentioned his book, he has an article and we have an article about 
prefiguration and the global subject. How are we going to get to produce this global subject with sufficient power to move us forward? Because it has to be a force with enough power to defeat fossil capital on the planet. So I uh, invite you to check it out. Well, with that being said, okay, thank you that, very much, David. Okay, and thank, thank you, you to thanks to you for participating and for the critical, fantastic questions that you've all given. And I hope that with this series, however, it will not um, only focus on um, political struggles, of course, those are fundamental, but the main aim is how can um, the biophysical sciences be uh, an appropriate and appropriated for the tasks ahead. Um, I hope that at least those aspects will not be forgotten as well, and that uh, the next iteration on um, microbial ecology will be uh, also useful in terms of understanding how the ecological sciences um, are crucially useful to uh, building socialism. Uh, so with that said, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, there are issues of capitalism, nature socialism, for those of you who might be interested, they're free for the taking. Thank you very much. Nino, it's good to see you again. Hey, all right. I never answered your question last time, you know? The, the, in the climate, um, climate change. Uh, oh, yeah, they're going to order it. Okay. They're going to, unfortunately, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you might get a, a, a used copy, okay. cheaper, but I think it's $38. But you can get on our book website, we have a more user friendly uh, book that 